Of course, most Europeans who emigrated to the United States came as Christians. But they must have also seen a mission field here, particularly among the Native Americans. At least that's what I, with my 21st century I see. Am I right? Were the colonists interested in bringing the gospel to Native Americans? And if so, how did they do that? Well, Nick, you're right. The many colonists were interested in, in uh, bringing the gospel to the people that were living here when the Europeans arrived, the Native Americans that, that uh, were commonly referred to as Indians. The, the big question, as you, as you rightly point out, is how? Uh, even if there was a desire to do so, it wasn't really clear how that could come about. Um, we shouldn't underestimate the enormous cultural and linguistic gulf that existed between the Europeans and the Native Americans. Um, the, these two peoples uh, were going to have a hard time understanding one another. Um, I'm sure that the Europeans were as uh, uh, surprising and, and uh, hard to understand uh, for the American Indians as the, uh, uh, as the Native Americans were for the Europeans. Um, uh, who frequently referred to the Indians as, as savages or barbarians, uh, even when they were trying to be nice. Um, an example of this was that when the Puritans settled in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, they concluded that the uh, Native Americans who were living there uh, had no claim on any of the ground because they hadn't fenced any of it in. Um, they, they had no permanently cultivated fields. Uh, and none of them held uh, written title to any of the land. So, of course, they assumed that since uh, they hadn't settled the land in the same way that, uh, uh, that English settlers might be expected to do, that, uh, that they had no claim on the land that was there. Naturally, the uh, indigenous inhabitants took a somewhat different view and uh, looked at these uh, new arrivals from England who uh, built fences and, and planted crops in permanent fields uh, as, uh, as intruders uh, to a greater or lesser extent. And that sort of misunderstanding on both sides was uh, uh, certainly repeated over and over again in the various colonies. Um, but Nick, I want to point back to the last question that, that Paul asked, and in part of my answer to that, uh, uh, when I talked about institutions of higher education as uh, uh, parts of a of a mission enterprise. Uh, I referred to, to Eliezer Wheelock and uh, Dartmouth College. Wheelock's vision was for a, a school or a college that would provide education for Indians uh, for the purpose of bringing the Indians to the, to the knowledge of salvation in Christ. That is, for, for converting Indians and for, for training their leaders. Um, that vision never quite materialized, of course. Uh, uh, the uh, white students quickly became a large majority at Dartmouth, um, and uh, they ha have never had a, a majority of Indian students. But still, Wheelock's vision points us uh, to this other dimension uh, of America as a mission field, uh, namely the urgent task of, uh, of bringing the gospel to Native Americans, and seeing the Native Americans as, uh, as a uh, people who, who needed to hear the gospel and needed to be converted to Christianity. As I said, many of the settlers uh, came with such an attitude, uh, even if they didn't always come with a, a clear idea of how that might be put into practice. There were others, of course, who, who doubted that that was a, a workable idea, and some even who, who doubted that it was necessary. Uh, there was a small minority who uh, concluded that the uh, Native Americans were, were little more than animals themselves, and uh, uh, even a few who said that uh, uh, the, the Indian didn't have a soul, uh, and therefore wasn't necessary to think about uh, converting them. Um, that was never a majority view, uh, even when the, the hostilities erupted and war broke out between the colonists and the, the Native Americans. Uh, most of the colonists recognized that these were were uh, fellow human beings, um, but nevertheless, there was a, a great, uh, great chasm between them that uh, was hard to cross. Let me back up before the English colonies uh, really got established and talk a little bit about uh, 
early Roman Catholic uh, mission work, the Roman Catholic orders, and especially the Jesuits, uh, carried out a great deal of very important missionary work uh, in, in Canada. Um, this often uh, resulted in martyrdom for, for some of the Jesuit priests and, uh, that were uh, engaged in the work, and uh, other orders soon followed and, and uh, swelled the troops. That spirit of willingness to sacrifice, even a willingness to, to undergo martyrdom, uh, was an important part of the dedication shown by these uh, early missionary orders. And I'd like to mention just, uh, just one or two names that are associated with that, uh, uh, with that work. Uh, Jean de Brebeuf was a, a Jesuit um, who came to uh, uh, Canada and began work about 1625. Um, he uh, started at the French settlement of Quebec and then made his way west uh, to the area around the Great Lakes and worked among the Huron Indians. Um, uh, Brebeuf was a, a great uh, advocate and recruiter of additional missionaries, uh, but he never romanticized the difficulties uh, of working among this very, very different uh, and in most ways much less advanced uh, people. He never uh, painted a rosy picture of the conditions under which uh, uh, missionaries would have to work. Uh, let me just take a moment and, and read part of a letter that he had written uh, to, back to uh, theological students and, and priests in France uh, urging them to consider service in, in the mission in Canada. Brebeuf be begins by describing the difficulties in even traveling to the places where the Hurons live. Um, there were no roads. The travel was mostly by uh, birch bark canoe. Uh, th this could take days, and, and uh, the travel was subject to uh, a variety of dangers. He describes the travel first, and then he gets into the, the uh, glorious life awaiting the new missionary. Easy as may be a, treat, uh, a trip with the savages, there is always enough to greatly cast down a heart not well under subjection. The readiness of the savages does not shorten the road, does not smooth out the rocks, does not remove the dangers. Be with whom you like. You must expect to be at least three or four weeks on the way, to have as companions persons you have never seen before, to be cramped in a bark canoe in an uncomfortable position, not being free to turn yourself to one side or the other, in danger fifty times a day of being upset or of being dashed upon the rocks. During the day, the sun burns you. During the night, you risk uh, of being a prey to mosquitoes. You sometimes ascend five or six rapids in a day, and in the evening, the only refreshment is a little corn crushed between two stones and cooked in fine, clear water. The only bed is the earth, sometimes only the rough, uneven rocks, and usually no roof but the stars, and all this in perpetual silence. If you are accidentally hurt, if you fall sick, do not expect from these barbarians any assistance. From whence could they obtain it? And if the sickness is dangerous, uh, and if you are remote from the villages, which are not very scattered, uh, I would not like to guarantee that they would not abandon you if you could not make shift to follow them. When you reach the Hurons, you will indeed find hearts full of charity. We will receive you with open arms. As an angel of paradise, we shall have all the inclination in the world to do you good, but we are so situated that we can do very little. We shall receive you in a hut, uh, so mean that I have scarcely found in France one wretched enough to compare with it. That is how you will be lodged, harassed and fatigued as you will be. You shall be able to, uh, we shall be able to give you nothing but a poor mat or at most a skin to serve as a bed. Uh, besides, you will arrive at a season when miserable little insects uh, that we call here tahuac, that's fleas, will keep you awake most of the night. Instead of being a great master and great theologian as in France, you must reckon on being here a humble scholar. And then, good God, with what must you reckon, uh, with what masters uh, 
women, little children, and all the savages, and exposed to their laughter. The Huron language will be your St. Thomas and your, and your Aristotle. And clever man as you are, and speaking glibly among learned and capable persons, you must make up your mind uh, to be for a long time mute among the barbarians. You will have accomplished much if at the end of a considerable time you begin to stammer a little. Brebeuf paints a pretty harsh and dismal picture of the, the conditions uh, that the uh, missionaries could face among the Hurons. Uh, it, he's rather realistic. What's re perhaps remarkable is that so many people actually responded to this call and the, the, the orders were able to recruit new missionaries uh, in significant numbers. Um, Brebeuf died in uh, 1649 uh, and uh, was followed uh, by many others from the, uh, from the Society of Jesus, from the Jesuits. Uh, one more that I'd like to mention is uh, Isaac Jogue, um, who was uh, actually martyred among the Indians in 1646 uh, and had worked uh, since the 1630s both among the Hurons and among the, the Chippewas further to the west. Uh, Jacques Marquette, another Jesuit, um, went as far as Wisconsin um, and uh, uh, worked among the, uh, uh, the Indians there and then also helped explore the reaches of the up upper Mississippi. These Jesuits were uh, tremendously willing to, to sacrifice and were in many cases very learned men. Uh, Marquette is said to have spoken uh, at least six Indian languages. Um, which he learned during his time uh, working among them. The, these Roman Catholic efforts uh, stand in, in stark relief to the, the, the often harsh exploitive treatment that uh, European uh, colonial masters showed to the Indians. And uh, in fact, uh, Indians and colonists were often uh, at war with one another. Um, but there were those, such as these Jesuits, that showed a different attitude and a willingness to uh, endure great hardship and even martyrdom uh, for the sake of spreading the gospel. If we turn to the Protestant uh, colonists who arrived in the English colonies, uh, several names uh, can also be mentioned. Um, most prominent among these is probably the name of John Eliot, um, uh, who lived from 1604 to 1690. Um, Eliot uh, came to the Massachusetts Bay Colony and became uh, a pastor in Roxbury, Massachusetts. Um, and while he was pastor there, he immediately set to work uh, trying to learn the, the Iroquois language of the Native American peoples that lived nearby. Uh, in this, he showed a remarkable aptitude and was able to uh, uh, not only learn the language, but also begin explaining Christianity to, uh, to some of the tribe, the uh, Pequot uh, Iroquois tribe uh, in his area. This uh, bore its first visible fruit in 1651 uh, when he baptized some of the tribe. Eliot discovered that uh, it was very difficult for uh, Native American converts to Christianity to, to, to maintain their faith and to live as Christians while remaining in, the, in their own villages, surrounded as they were by, by non-Christians. Uh, so he undertook a task of establishing uh, what were called praying towns. These were uh, more or less separate villages designed and set up for Christian converts from among the Indian tribes where they could live in a, a way that was acceptable to them, that was more familiar to them from their traditional way of life, but at the same time practice their faith because they were living together with other Christian Indians. Uh, Eliot eventually established some 14 of these praying towns uh, which were inhabited by uh, uh, over 3,600 uh, Christian converts from the Iroquois uh, people. Um, by the, that, that, and that uh, had been accomplished by the 1670s or so. Um, and in addition to that, uh, he made the very important contribution of translating the Bible uh, into an Indian language, um, first the, the New Testament and then the Old.
and uh, spent much of his later years uh, training and educating uh, Iroquois leaders uh, to, to be preachers in these uh, Indian communities. There were 24 such uh, Iroquois preachers at the time of, of Eliot's death in 1690. So John Eliot really stands out as, a, as an early pioneer in the, the task of bringing the gospel uh, in a variety of ways to the Native Americans. Doing it, A, by learning their language, B, by translating the scriptures, and C, by finding uh, culturally appropriate ways uh, for the Indian converts to, to live with other believers that, uh, that could sustain their faith and help them to, to live in faith. In generations following Eliot, uh, there are others who attempt to follow his example, but none who are, are, are quite as, as successful and fruitful in their work. Um, the, uh, uh, the missionary and, and preacher David uh, Brainerd, uh, born in 1718, died in 1747, uh, died very young. Um, after exhausting himself through his uh, labors with the Indians in his area. So his, uh, his work was prematurely cut off, uh, but he did leave behind uh, an, an inspirational uh, journal or diary that uh, inspired later generations of missionaries. Uh, we hear this story frequently um, in, in mission history that uh, a particular missionary uh, endures hardship uh, seems to have little fruit from his work and then uh, dies without seeing real results. But his example uh, paves the way for others to follow after him. Uh, the, and the last name I'd like to mention is uh, uh, Eliezer Wheelock himself, the founder of Dartmouth College uh, that I referred to in an earlier answer. His vision of providing higher education uh, for Native Americans uh, was was revolutionary at, at the time, um, uh, but ultimately unsuccessful, um, never really met with the success. Why don't these efforts have lasting success, and why is the, uh, the history of mission work among American Indians so, uh, so checkered? That has to do with the, the broader relationships between the European colonists and the American Indians. Uh, there were frequent wars. The increasing European population demanded more and more land, which pushed the Native American population uh, further and further away from their, uh, their homelands. Uh, this increased the tension and conflict between the two groups. Uh, in, in some cases, the result of wars was that uh, uh, whole populations of, uh, of Indian tribes uh, uh, were essentially wiped out. Um, the fact of the matter is today that uh, there's not a living person who can read uh, John Eliot's Bible translation. The, the language into which he translated the Bible uh, died out entirely. Uh, so there's a, there's a process of uh, cultural and, and uh, ethnic conflict that, uh, that has gone on r literally for centuries between the European arrivals and the American Indians. And that's, uh, that has created a a history of, uh, of conflict and sometimes uh, a legacy of mistrust uh, that hasn't been easy to overcome. Um, but there were early colonial leaders that, that saw this as an important obligation and that, that uh, exercised a, a good deal of, uh, of creative energy in uh, meeting that challenge and, and uh, uh, paving the way for, for that, uh, the message of the gospel to, to be brought also to the indigenous inhabitants of, of the Americas.